The following podcast was recorded at the ANZUX Safety and Quality Conference, July 2014. Rapid Response Teams. Rich Horwin asks, how do we know that the team has been successful? Being a very, very tall order indeed, and I'm not sure I've got the answers, but I'll at least sort of expand on a few points. Um, first off, I will say that um, Chris, Alex and I did not actually collaborate to turn this into a Star Wars convention. Um, obviously, sort of great minds think alike. Um, so, so I think it's sort of um, a lot of the efforts around um, rapid response systems have very appropriately um, concentrated on the afferent limb, you know, that bit to make sure that we're appropriately calling, that we're calling on the right patients and we're actually sort of sending the right people to them. Um, I think there's, there's a need for a lot more um, work around what actually happens once the team's pitched up to the patient. Inevitably, we send you know, experienced people, we send competent clinicians who've got a great sort of desire to do well for the patient. And I think there's a slight sort of risk that we assume that they will do a good job, that they will do, they'll perform optimally. And much of the time, I'm sure they do, but I'm not sure that necessarily we can always assume that's the case. So something we're looking at is trying to measure exactly sort of how are they doing um, and it's very, very difficult. So inevitably it's easy and the bin counters always want to concentrate on numbers. Um, I appreciate it's a slightly sort of poor resolution but um, this is a reporting tool that we're in the process of developing for our project which is purely looking at the um, efferent limb stuff. This is just purely um, what happens and, and you know, outcomes that we think we can tie into the team's performance. And as you can see there's an awful lot of buttons for reports and you know, we're, we're still sort of struggling to work out which ones are the best. Um, there's various things that we can look at and again, you know, we can sort of take cues from the commission, you know, for unplanned admissions, um, you know, cardiac arrests that are unexpected or soon after a review and even how long the team's actually spending there. But unfortunately, I think a lot of these numbers are fairly misleading and KPIs, and I won't steal um, John's thunder, um, but KPIs risk sort of becoming a rod for our own back. Um, and especially to do with team performance, it's very difficult to nut out exactly whether the outcome with the number, that the, the metric we can, um, we can record in a spreadsheet, whether that's actually purely due to the team doing well or doing poorly, or whether it's just due to one of many other confounding factors within the patient's hospital stay. Um, so something we're also sort of doing alongside that is um, asking um, people how they think they're going. So we're actually in the process of surveying our, our MET workforce, so the, the guys who actually go out on the calls and effectively sort of um, asking them to do a little bit of self-reflection. How do you think you're going? How do you think you get on at MET? Do you think you're doing a good job? And fortunately, sort of most of the times so I can sort of show with the pointer, um, they're doing sort of quite well, they think. Um, obviously they're going to be a little bit biased, so we're asking exactly the same question from the people who actually call them out, um, just to make sure that you know, we, um, we're not sort of seeing a little bit of a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And fortunately, again, it does seem that uh, most of the workforce actually out there on the wards, the ones who are actually activating MET, feel that the MET is a valuable and a worthwhile service, and that when the team turns up that they interact well and that they, um, they do generally sort of perform as expected. Obviously, I'd like to sort of get more strongly agrees, but, you know, that's maybe sort of, you know, we'll see whether we improve that at the end. Um, something that um, I'm sort of increasingly interested in is actually sort of watching the teams at play. It's very easy in the simulation environment. We can sort of sit behind the two-way glass. We can sort of throw them at it. We can sort of give them all sorts of curveballs with the scenario and see how they cope. And it's very easy to um, do observation using a sort of multitude of um, scoring systems um, in that kind of controlled environment. But as I said, I feel that um, you know, people do sort of play the game a little bit when they're in simulation, no matter how immersive you try and make it. And so um, this is some research that um, I think um, you know, some team allied with Ken did um, some years ago. Um, in Liverpool, actually following out the teams to the wards, watching them in action and filming them. And this is something uh, that we're sort of planning to do as a sort of later stage of our project. Unfortunately, sort of legal, um, sort of practically sort of had a um, vase of vagal when I told them I wanted to film um, on the wards, um, but they have authorised us to go out sort of with clipboards and follow the teams around, even though we know that's not you know, necessarily sort of catching people in a completely uncontaminated way. And inevitably, you know, we, we do want to actually look and see how the guys are doing. And, you know, as I said, if need be, we just have to have somebody with a clipboard standing at the side of the room watching. 
And the question then becomes, well, what do you actually measure? You know, what, what do you sort of assess them against? Um, inevitably, we want them to do their clinical skills well. We want them to not faff around, to make the right decisions, um, for those decisions to be correct, you know, for us not to wind up with 475 milligrams of metoprolol being given to the patient, um, and the correct procedures being done in a competent way without adverse events. Um, something I'm sort of quite a big fan of is something called no flow time, and as I said, this comes out a lot from simulation, which is teams that work poorly as a team tend to spend a lot of time doing, um, or, not, or rather not doing a great deal, um, the so-called <coughs> so therapeutic vacuum. And so um, I think, you know, that's something worthwhile to look at is, and that's maybe why duration of MET, while not a perfect metric, is something that can be, can be sort of used. Um, increasingly, I think that it's the way that the team work, actually while they're out at the MET, that, um, that is valuable to look at as well. And there's a number of ways that sort of you can do that. But I think, again, in simulation, it's very easy to see teams performing well and to see them improve during a day of simulation training. But that's fine in the simulation setting, but what about when they actually go out to the real MET? Are they actually transferring those skills out? Is it actually value adding to the, um, to the way that they behave? And the question then obviously becomes, well, what do we look at? You know, how do we measure their performance in the field? Um, a lot of the tools have been developed for use in simulation, but I don't see any reason why they can't be used you know, in, for real as well. Um, we can look at just the clinical skills, where they perform them correctly at the right time and so on. Um, we can look at just purely whether they work well as a team. You know, we ignore all the clinical stuff. We just concentrate on the non-technical skills side of things. Or um, do we sort of take a cue from um, Anne Leipert's group in, um, in Denmark and do a combination of both and see it all as a sort of bit of a package of care that we want them to be doing the procedures, but we want them to be working well as a team together. And we use a sort of bit of a hybrid model to see um, that both are being done and both are, are, are working well and, and complementing each other. Um, while not really a sort of a, a very sort of tangible uh, measure of, of team success or team performance, um, I still think it's worthwhile um, doing some debrief, and we obviously discussed that in a previous session. Um, because inevitably, when we sort of pull people out of the simulations and we get them back in the room, we ask them to debrief themselves as clinicians, and especially as conscientious ones. As soon as I ask the question, "So how do you guys feel you went?" inevitably they always want to um, pick on the negative stuff oh, we didn't do this, we forgot to do that, we took too long to do X. So inevitably clinicians are always sort of very um, critical of themselves. And so I think um, we can, in a manner of speaking, harness some of that honesty and rather than seeing it as an opportunity to get them to beat themselves up, obviously use it as a learning opportunity. So, and again, you know, I was talking to um, Teresa about, um, you know, that reinforcement of training. So, you know, if we chuck you back into the same scenario, what things would you do differently? Bearing in mind also that when we go out and we watch the guys in the field, or even when we watch them in scenarios, um, there's a lot of stuff that isn't, in, isn't said. There's obviously a lot of thought processes going on in their heads. There's a lot of that sort of non-verbal communication goes on between teams. And it's difficult when you're standing on the other side of the um, glass with a clipboard to know that they have spotted stuff. They have picked up that the patient was going blue and the sats were dropping and so on. So I think it's quite useful to pull these guys out and, and ask them, you know, so what did you pick up? Did you notice that? You know, did they have situational awareness? And a lot of the time, actually, they have actually, um, you know, synthesized things even if they haven't necessarily verbalized it. And as I said, I think it's sort of very useful, you know, this um, sort of concept, you know, if you're going to audit something or measure something, you know, make sure you throw it back and then use it to actually achieve quality improvement. And certainly that works very well in simulation where um, in, one, in one of the sort of the courses I, um, I um, teach with, um, we actually get the participants to debrief each other. So we have one group actually sort of doing the scenario, another group sitting in, an, in a separate room watching them you know, through TV screens, and then we get the participants to feed back to each other, knowing that then they'll be a little bit more compassionate and helpful, because it's not sort of learn a student power distance, we've actually sort of got people on a level playing field trying to help one another out. Obviously, the utopian, as we sort of you know, get to George Clooney and, co and colleagues, um, with sort of highly performing teams, 
Um, and I think, look, we're, we're, we're a long way along the, along the road already. Um, you know, our teams do well, um, and I say this from the experience of going out and watching them in the field, um, but there's always sort of room for improvement. As I said, I think sort of that team skills that is relatively sort of deficient in a lot of our um, postgraduate and undergraduate training is again a sort of uh, a very sort of um, worthwhile um, avenue for the future. Okay. For more podcasts from Antics, go to antics.com.au.